Hello everyone, hope you are having a good day. If not, this game will definitely make your day really great. So, we have we are going to have a look at a game by Mikhail Tal, but not very typical Mikhail Tal game, not uh, some sparkling sacrifices which are very typical of him. And of course, they are great to watch. They are great inspiration for all of us and we have all at some point in our life tried to imitate Tal, try to play like him. And obviously, we know what happens when you do that. But we have definitely tried because he's at some point he is a hero for all of our, all the players. Uh, everyone watching, I'm sure at some point in your life, you admired him and you tried to play like him. So, generally we do cover endgames on our channel and this is going to be an endgame lesson, but from Mikhail Tal. And I do feel like Mikhail Tal was a great endgame player. Also, he has great positional understanding. And why do I say that? Well, most of us think that a player is uh, very good at tactics. Like, some, let, let's say someone like uh, Petrosian. Most players think that Petrosian was a great positional player. He was. That was his style of play and it worked for him. At the same time, I do feel like he was a great tactician. He saw so many tactics around him. Same goes for Tal. Many of sa Tal's sacrifices were actually positional. They were, Although they were unsound, they had positional basis. And so I would say that Tal's positional understanding was way superior. That's a world champion. He was a world champion. You cannot be a world champion without being good at everything. So Tal was good at everything. Just about everything. Every aspect of chess. But he was more known, more uh, renowned for his tactical abilities. That was his style of play. But a world champion is generally good at everything. Let's clear that up. So, this is going to be a great endgame uh, lesson from Mikhail Tal himself. So, let's get going. Let's learn from his games. Let's see what he has to teach us here. So, Tal was playing against Smirov, uh, Smirin. Uh, this is white to play. This position has came out of a King's Indian, the exchange variation. And... White has some play. From this point on, you will see Tal putting extreme pressure on his opponent. So let's have the first step. In this position, Tal plays rook to d8, check. And after king g7, basically what you have is, life is very difficult for black right now because his bishop is pinned. It can't move because the rook is kind of in breeze up to the bishop moves. So that's why it's very tough for black to complete his rest of the development. So there will always be pressure over here. One of the ways to develop the bishop is to go b6, bishop b7, but that will cost black at least two moves. Let's see what will happen in the game. How do you proceed from here? What do you play from here? Just go ahead and try to find the move. Maybe give yourself five seconds and try to guess the move that Tal played. All right, Tal played an excellent move here. Tal realized uh, this knight on e4 is one of the only pieces, apart from the rook over here, is one of the only pieces active that black has in this position. So it's always a great idea that to trade opponent's active pieces. So he took this knight and after rook takes, now basically black only has one active piece, whereas white has his rook active. This rook will soon come in the game. This bishop is already active. Our king is very close to the center and it will be it will play a critical role. So first things first, you have a choice. The bishop is under attack. Would you play it prefer it on d3 or f3? Normal mortal like you and me, like normal people, normal chess players would have simply played bishop d3, defending the pawn, kicking the rook out, a very natural move. But let's say what we, what happens if we play bishop d3. The problem is now black's problems are more or less solved. He can continue with rook e7. There are two ideas. He can go with the old and working plan, which is b6, bishop b7, or even the improved version of playing rook to d7 and then trying to exchange the rook off or, or, or trying to get some pressure if the if white avoids that then probably he can again go for b6 bishop b7 but that is one of the point and you can see you cannot avoid this uh, rook d7 move because the rook the the d file has been closed for the other rook and that is exactly what tal understood here and at this point tal played bishop f3 he is not afraid of sacrificing the pawn he knows that what matters in rook end games is activity 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 there he goes for. Now, by the way, rook e7 is no longer great because now you can play rook h to d1. You're controlling the d7 square. So rook d7 is out of option. And this white would have uh, put a lot of pressure on black's position here. So going back in this position, obviously, black thought Tal has given me a pawn. Why should I not capture it? He took the pawn. This is actually not a bad move. But now the question is, where would again you put your king? Would you put it on b1? Or something active like d2. Tal went for the active move, king to d2. It's a very good move. By the way, king to b1 would uh, lose the game right away with bishop f5. There is a discovery on the rook. 
there is a problem, the rook is going to drop off. That's the reason we have to step up the board. The king, remember, the king is a very active piece. The king is a very powerful piece. Use it. I think someone like Steinis said it or Lasker. I don't know. Maybe you can comment in the right in the comment section who exactly said it that the king is a very active and strong piece. It's a powerful piece. Use it. So definitely, Tal is using his king. His king is superior to his opponent's king. His rook is superior to this rook. His bishop is far superior to this bishop. The only thing is the rook. So Tal realized it. And a strong player always plays with all of his pieces. So let's see what happens here. Black now plays c5. I think this is a slight error. He had some choices. He should have probably went for something like b6, bishop, b7, trying to free his problem. That is major problem. And he should solve his major problem like that. But he went for c5. Obviously, there is a plan with this move, as we are going to soon, as we are soon gonna see. White now realized. Look at this. This rook is extremely active, and my rook is not active. Tal realized. Always exchange the pieces. Always exchange your opponent's active pieces for your non-active pieces. He should have played. Uh, Tal played rook to c1. Extremely brilliant move. Very good move. By the way, why do I call it brilliant? Because there was another move which looks normal to mortals like us. And many of us would have simply played rook to e1. The idea is quite simple. You would like to play rook to e8 and you think with the rooks being there, this bishop is kind of a goner. You can't really save it. But there is a tactical problem with this move, which obviously Tal would spot in a second. The move, the problem is rook to c2. Check. If you step up, uh, up the board, then you're going to drop the pawns. Also, bishop f5 is kind of a threat if you step up the board. If you go down, probably just uh, he'll, he'll munch up your pawns. So what happens if that's captured? The problem is bishop f5. The rook is under attack. Rook has to come down. Rook has to try to survive. But now you see the point of playing c5. There was an idea. And the idea is to play c4. And black is going to regain material with some advantage, with compensation at least. I think black will be at least all right here. At least okay. So... Having seen all of this, Tal obviously calculated the tactics smoothly. He just served through the tactics and he found the move rook c1 quite instantly. He, he decided to trade his passive piece for his opponent's active piece. And now black should have uh, played for rook to d4, trying to exchange the rooks. And after takes takes, obviously the pawn on d4 looks like a goner. That pawn will soon be dropping off. White will gain that pawn. At the same time, at least black would have solved his problems and yeah, uh, went for more. But in this position, black captured the rook. He did not find any problem with this. The thing is, after the capture, it's only white's pieces which are active. The bishop and the rook, they are too active, they're too powerful. And the king will soon come in the game. This is totally a one-sided game. And Tal just squeezes his opponent perfectly. So let's have a look at it. H5. Black is trying to be ambitious. Tal stops him. H4. The spawn on H4 dominates both the spawns and stops him from going forward. Black says, all right, I can play rook to b8, trying to get out of the pin over here. So maybe my b pawn is now free to move. So Tal continued with rook to e8. Excellent move. Basically, the point is you want to stop the king from coming here and here. He wanted to stop the king from like, sorry for that. Coming to the e7 square, getting some activity. So Tal just plays rook to e8, stops that plan. And now the king, obviously it can come to f6, but it has no great point over there. So f6 is played again black is insisting black wants to play king f7 try to get his king in the game at the same time then uh kind of pushing the rook out of the corner pushing the rook out of the black position after the rook comes down then the bishop will move and he will have no problems at all so how do we solve this problem tal plays a very good move here bishop to d5 controlling the f7 square saying yeah i like your king to be i prefer your king to be passive let him stay like that so g5 played again how do you play these are small tiny uh, decisions that you have to make every move that really uh, defines the class of a player anyone like us many of us would have simply captured and that is actually not a great idea because then you allow him to have a pass pawn on the edge file at some point maybe not not right now but at some point so that's not really a great move one of the things you have to do is keep control that's very important when you're squeezing your opponent when you're giving a positional squeeze it's very important to keep the control g3 obviously is the move you keep the control you don't let him to get a passed pawn or allow him to create one and basically king g6 is played our bishop way too superior, superior than any other piece even even it's, it's definitely stronger than the rook i would say it's extremely powerful 
Aruk just dominates and dominates and puts a lot of pressure. Uh, it's it's hell for Black. Life is hell for Black. He cannot develop his pieces sensibly. There's only one issue. Stal realized, well, there's something that I'm missing. The king on C1. I would like to get the king, probably to F4, and then everything will be ready and I'll be ready to win the game. So, king D2 played, B5, king E3. The king is marching across the board. Kings are generally vulnerable pieces, remember, but uh, when it comes to end games, kings become extremely powerful. They are very powerful because there are no queens on the board and they uh, nobody can hunt them down. So, B4. Again, Tal wants Tal wants some control over the position. He plays a3, stops the pawn from advancing too much, takes takes a5, king f4. We have the ideal position. We wanted the king on f4, we have it. We wanted the bishop over here, we have it. Look over here. And you can see most of this cover uh, squares are covered, and that's why none of the, his pieces can move. The rook can't go here because bishop controls, the rook can't step here because the bishop is hanging, the bishop can't move because the rook is kind of and freeze. It's a hell of a position for him. There are hardly any moves for him. And probably anything he moves. He In the game he played a4. White just played f3. Passing on the move. And it's nearly a zook swing for him I would say. He has options like f5 and king g7. And against both the moves there is one common move that white can play. Let's say king g7 was played in the game. Now white can play bishop e6. Finally it's time. We have a king ideally placed. Actually, this move was available from quite a, quite uh, quite many moves. It was available from few moves earlier also. And uh, but Tal did not hesitate. He realized that he can increase the pressure. He can first advance his king, and he always has this move whenever he wants to play. This is the time he played it. It has to be captured, otherwise Black is simply losing the bishop, and that will be detrimental. So the rook is given up. Black tries desperately to create some counterplay. He wants to make his pawn. A passer trying to push this, but that's not going to work against Tal because Tal perfectly plays the technical part. In fact, it's not, it doesn't even last for two more moves. After rook b5, this is the point where black resigned. Uh, the pawn is attacked. Only way to save the pawn is to push it. But then what happens is you take the pawn on h5, you create a passed pawn of your own, and the rook will simply come and sit on the c5 square. And you can never promote because the, dust, the, the promotion square is a dust square. Whenever he promotes, we'll just capture it. That pawn is not going anywhere. Whereas our H pawn will be a big threat to him, and this is an easy, easy game for a player like Tal, a world champion, uh, to convert. This is not a not a big deal at all. So, what a great game! What a great positional squeeze! And we hardly get to see such games uh, from from such great players. But yes, these players are good at everything. They are good at tactics. They are good at positional play. They are good at end games. They are good at strategy. They are this very good at everything. Obviously, they have their own styles, just like all of us do. But these players are totally balanced. So, what a great game by Mikhail Dahl. Hope you enjoyed it. Throughout the week, we are going to cover great uh, chess moves and end games from Tal, which I think is a lesser cover topic. So, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and do subscribe to my YouTube channel. More videos are on the way. By the way, do enjoy the quote about some sacrifices sound, the rest are mine. It's one of the most famous quotes of Mikhail Tal. I really love it. And uh, it, it talks a lot about his personality. So, until next time.